Good evening. This week's Parsha, Parsha Shalach, which of course talks about the, the story of the Miraglim, and we know we paid a very big price because of the Miraglim, that they went for 40 days to Eretz Yisrael to spy it out, and they came back and they spoke Lashon Hara on Eretz Yisrael, HaKadosh Baruch Hu was very upset. The night they came back was Tisha B'Av. And Hashem said, you cried on Tisha B'Av for nothing. I will give you something to cry about on Tisha B'Av, which both Batei Migdash were destroyed on Tisha B'Av. And there would have been the Gula Shalema at that time, but because of what the Miraglin did, we're in Gola still today. There would have been a complete kapara of the eagle, and we would have been in a completely different situation uh, had we, had they not, had the story not happened. Now, most Nefarshim go into a lengthy discussion, how could have this happen? The Pasuk says, Kulam Anoshim, and all the Mepharshim, Rashi, Medrash, everybody, that these were tzaddikim. So how did they fall in like this? And there are many ways, many paths of explanation to this entire Parsha, but the Shalom HaKadosh, has a very unique explanation. And he says that they were special people and they remain special people. How could that be? So he explains like when the Pasuk says that they said Eretz al Chalas Yoshveha, that it's a land that consumes its inhabitants. We saw funerals all over the place that they saw it, that they would have been discovered as spies if it wouldn't have been so many funerals taking place. So people were busy with the funerals. They didn't notice that there were some men drifting around. So says the Shlach Kodesh, and he says that when they said that, that, uh, Bale Midos, the Anshe Midos, that the people living there were giants that will never stand a chance against them. The Shlach Kodesh touched it, Anshe Midos, like a Bal Midos, that they were very refined and very so. And the Vilna Gon says that that is part of the Yetzirah that he places a person in a position. He knows that with this person, he's never going to succeed. But there is in the Teva put into Rishoim, who can influence Yidin, that they're especially nice guys. So says the Vilna Gong. Meaning that at his time, there was this, the beginning of this Haskola movement, and it started flourishing. And he said of the reform, I mean, it wasn't really at that point called reform, but it was this Haskola movement that they wanted to show that they could be nice people and that people would point to them and learn from them and act like them just because they're such nice guys. And we found that many of those who became, let's say, these reform rabbis, they made sure to give the poor food, they made sure before Shabbos to do exemplary things that would sway the opinion and the population 
to them. Because they said, listen, they may be doing things differently with the Torah, but look what nice guys they are. Says the Vilna Gon that this was especially done to accommodate the Yitzhahara to be able to win over from good to bad people by judging how nice they are and how they appear on the surface to be. But it's only part, <coughs> excuse me, of a major tactic of the Yitzhahara. And conversely, he says, we find sometimes a Talmud Chacham who's made, who may be a tremendous Talmud Chacham, but he's not a nice person. And that is a test to the people around him that they shouldn't say, what? This is what being a Talmud Chacham or being a, a Jew is supposed to be and how to behave? If this is it, I don't want it. So that likewise is a test for a yid. So said the Vilna Gom. And over here, the, the Shalak Kodesh says, when they said Anche Midas, they meant not just the way we translated that they were giants and they would devour us and they would overwhelm us, but Anche Midas, we found them to be nice people to each other that they were very gracious and they were, and that was, according to the Shalar Kaddosh, how they came back and this is what they described. Now they added their own comment, commentary. And the question is what suddenly happened? In other words, the first few statements they made were true. There were Levias and there were they were, they were reporting what they saw. What suddenly changed the atmosphere? Because when they were speaking, they were speaking with a negative slant. And Kolev jumped up, as our Parsha tells us, and Vayas Kolev as he said, nonsense, stop talking. It's not so. The, the land is beautiful. The land is wonderful. To... Now, Mephorshim say that the things that they said on a negative slant or not true was after Kalev jumped up in the middle of their report and tried to shut them up. And human nature is that when you're having a dispute with somebody else, and the person gets up and says, you're not presenting your point of view and I'll present mine, so stop talking. You're wrong. That challenges a human by human nature to go out of his way to show that he's right. That a person could even begin lying and twisting and uh, because you're under a different umbrella now survival of in the public arena while you're having this debate with two people with the other person who has the opposing view so the Ramban says that they knew they were tzaddikim, they knew that they would lose their positions in Eretz Yisrael. They were sorry alafim, sorry chamishim, they were big people. But when they would get to Eretz Yisrael, they would lose the position. So why did they go? So the answer is that a person, when he's given a task, and people get up and say, we don't think you could really accomplish this, you do it. That sets off in the person the willingness to prove him wrong that he will succeed. So even though they were told that they're gonna lose their jobs and they're going to, they still wanted to go to prove it. But it was when Kolev absolutely challenged them 
That's when they went into the gray area to really scare the people and say things that were not uh, 100% uh, in the right column. Now, the question is that they were moitzi dibas horas. They talked lush and horror against their itself. So Hashem said, you were there for 40 days, so I'm going to turn the 40 days into 40 years. And for each day they were there, they had to stay a year in the Midbar. And as we know, as it says, that they really in 11 days would have been from Egypt, from Mitzrayim to Eretz Yisrael. But it was only because of this chet. They had to remain there and they began crisscrossing up and down, back and forth, but they didn't have to do it. And their, their doing this was the punishment for the Lashon Hara. So ask the Mephorshim, Lashon Hara, they didn't talk for 40 days. They were in there, so they came back and they spoke for an hour or two by Claudius so to report back. That was the Lashonara. So why were they blamed for the whole 40 days if the actual Lashonara that they spoke was only for two or three hours when they got back? And Mepharshim say they were blamed for the whole 40 days because they had a jaundice eye. When they went there and they saw that, where are we leaving? We're going to leave the desert, the Midbar, where our bread is mon and where the water is the miracle of Miriam's bear well. And the clothes grew on them, excuse me, and was washed every day. And iron and starched. So they were living with miracles. What were they missing? These, these spies went in and saw that they're going to have to start plowing the ground, become farmers, and they're going to have to actually live a physical life, which they were not living in the Midbar. It was a miracle life. And that's a very big theme in many of the Hasidic svar of what this whole issue of the spies was. The issue was that they felt that we don't have to work. We only enjoy spirituality. And our whole existence is a miracle. Why give that up to become farmers? And in the answer from Yoshua and from Kole, we, we see specifically that Kole said, Olo na'ala, and in many of the Hasidic forum, they say, what did he say by that? Because when a person deals with the mundane and this world and out of the, from the spiritual world, like the neshama comes into the person and he's in a physical world with all the temptations and with all the things he has to do for survival, that you fall from madrega. And they were saying that they're going to fall in the Ruchnius. That's why the Shema doesn't want to come to this world and to the Guf either. But if he can overcome the temptations and put spirituality into every aspect of his life here in this world, then he ends up much higher than he would have been had he not come down. But it's a test, and it's a very big test. And unfortunately, many don't get over the bump in the road. They falter at that point and stay there, and they're dragged down uh, with it. But 
that's what Kolev meant when he said, Olo Nala, Olo will go up to Eretz Yisrael. And when we do our mission of turning all that Gashmias that we're going to have, like I always say to you, a person does a mitzvah and he thinks, for Shalom, I'm doing this for you, it should be a nachas ruach to you. He turns the whole mitzvah into spirituality, even if it's at the lowest madriga, that means he's not even thinking about shaking the lul of an esri. He's thinking about something else, but he makes the brach and he shakes it. So he turns it into spiritual, he does the mitzvah. But the level of how polished the mitzvah is, and how grand the luster is of the mitzvah depends on his machshava, what he's thinking with that. And included in that, if he says, I could have brought with this is for you, he gives it at the highest level. He turns in that physical estrogen into the most spiritual thing in its accomplishment. And what are the chiefs in his ruchnias? And that's really the job of a person the entire time. So when these judge, when these spies came back, they were they they realized that a person that could overcome all of the Gashmias could end up higher. But they felt that many will never make it because they're coming from such spirituality into a mundane daily world with temptations, with Yetzirahs, with all of these things that how will they ever uh, succeed in that mission? But that's really in a nutshell what most of the Swarm, Chabad Swarm, all the others, that a person comes into this world and whether he's here for 70 years or he's here for 120 years, it flies by. And the only thing is that every act, every machshava, every deeper, every maisa, we have to do our best to be able to glorify that specific physical act that we're doing. Rav Palm always used to say that when somebody before uh, he finishes chakras and he has a bite and then he runs off to work. How do we know that those 10 hours of work are transformed into ruchnias? What he does afterwards, because if he comes home and he eats and he spends a half an hour and then he goes to learn, so it means really that he would have been learning all day. But he has to make a parnasa, so he's going to the parnasa to be able to provide for himself and his family what they need to live. So those two hours after work, say Edus, are a testimony to his 10 hours of working early in the day that he really would have had part and parcel every minute and every hour of learning. But he had to go to work. So that elevates the work. The hours of the work go into a category, and there's levels of category. I mean, if a guy just thinks, well, I'm going for pranasa. That's fine, that's nice, but it's not, nothing compared to somebody who, before he begins work, and says, I'm with this, and this is for you, our Kodesh Baruch Hu. So there should be money to pay tuition, there should be money to buy all the mitzvahs, to buy tefillin, to buy the matzahs, to buy everything that we we need to buy with, that we should be able to do it wholeheartedly for you. And that was what the Miraglim felt, that why give all of all of this ruchnias and have to be in a position of doubt but the reason that we keep 40 days against 40 years is because if a person has, oh, thank you, sister. Mm -hmm. If a person has yeah. a bad eye, eye view on things, a jaundice eye, then his perspective is always tainted. And that's what happened here with the Maraglam. They went in as tzaddikim. 
and they came back pretty impressed. But as soon as they were challenged, or as soon as they were thinking about their jobs, it turned into a little bit of a colorful denial of the benefits and the simple reason that with all the tainas, the Kali Yisrael should have said, Hashem told us to go in. We saw the miracles in Mitzrayim. We saw the miracles in the Midbar, which we are experiencing now every day of our lives. Hashem said that's enough for us. We don't have to have a debate if it's good or it's not good. And since they had a jaundiced view, they colored all 40 days that they were there. So it's true, they didn't speak Lashon Hara for 40 days, only for two hours. But the 40 days tainted their whole attitude to what they were going to eventually say because they came in with a negative attitude. And that is the story for us on any occurrence and anything that could happen within the realm of what we do. We can go to a Malava Malka, we can go to a Bar Mitzvah, and the people work so hard to make it a beautiful Malava Malka or Bar Mitzvah L'Shem Shemayim, and that it should be looked at in that way. And many people leave and say, what a beautiful Mesiba L'Shem Shemayim. And there are others who will always pick the negative, that their whole perception of the work that went into it and the buying of the food and the, ser- the cooking of the food and the preparation of the Malava Malka and then the serving and the cleaning and everything, the hours and days that went in to prepare if you've got a negative attitude, you'll always find something that wasn't perfectly in place or in order, and you will be the naysayer, the cynic, the sarcastic person with the comments coming from your mouth. Now, there is a Haftorah this Shabbos, which is the first parak of Yoshua, which tells the story of how Yehoshua sent into Eretz Yisrael two spies, Kalev and Pinchas. And they came in and they were to search out the land and to see what's doing. And the people in Israel sense that these there's somebody here that they, they're moving around. And, and they went to hide by Rochov. Now Rochov is called Rochov Azoina, which means she was involved in some very improper behavior. Other Mephortim types the word Zoina, Mizonos that she fed people because she had an inn. But most of them, of course, will go with the first one, that she was busy with improper behavior. And we find that here in our Parsha, they were tzaddikim, and they ended up in trouble and bringing a calamity. They wreaked havoc for Klaiso. Yet Rochov, who was a Zoyna, she not only saved the two, but you see that she was very airlock and she kept her word and she this and that. And at the end, Yoshua married her. Yoshua, when he came in there, so she was Megayer and he married her. And they had daughters, they never had any sons. So why Rachav, who was living such a life, they ended up, the, the spies succeeding in their thing and everything was wonderful, and our spies who began as tzaddikim did not 
succeed in their mission. So Mepharshim say that there's a difference when you begin a mission with full emuna or not. She was not behaving, but she had a lot of emuna. And we see that when she was confronted, which she would have been killed on the spot, she didn't waver from her word that she gave to Kolev and Pinchas, and she sent them off running in a different direction, the army or the people who came to catch the spies, and it saved them. They went down a rope and escaped and were able to get back to Eretz Yisrael. I mean, to uh, to Yoshua. And that's why it's the center this week, because it talks about spies, and we have in our parsha. there's always a common denominator of something in the parsha that's chosen uh, in the Haftorah to be the Haftorah, that it has a connection to something of the Sedra, and that's the connection. Spies and spies. Now, the Chidush Rim asks, on this Haftorah, that what were they doing when they were in spying, Kolev and Pinchas? They were acting as pottery salesmen. Pottery. Why pottery? Why not silver, gold, uh, jewelry, different things? Why did they choose pottery? Asks the Chidushe Harim. And the Chedushi Harim says that pottery is cheres, and cheres does not become tame only from the outside. The inside does not become tame unless it's being used and something tame falls in, but if it's not, only the outside. And that was a message to themselves and to call yourself, we are nothing. We are like pottery. That it's the inside that counts, and if we're the outside, the external, we're not worried about. But inside, we consider ourselves non existent. We're only here on the shlichos of our Kurdish Baruch, Hu, and we hope we'll accomplish it and we'll come back alive, and that will be. And it was the entire story with such a backbone, with such a cementing factor of emuna that propelled them to have a very successful story. And says the Chidush Yerim, that's why they were doing pottery. Because the difference from the inside, it doesn't become tame, it's only the outside. Because it's worthless. And that was the message of, of these two, that we are at some worthless. We're only focusing, we have no cheshbit of what we will do, how will we survive. We are, whether we're, we survive, we don't survive, we have to only look forward to what we must do and not be concerned with the outside. So indeed, they were able to master the situation and they were able to do what they had to do, and it came out with perfection. Now, Moshe Rabbeinu, just before the Moraglan left, he changed the name of Yoshua. His name was Hosea. By Yikra, Moshe Lahosea bin Nun, Yehoshua. He changed his name. And he took the yud from Sarai that was floating, the Medrash says, all those years and never attached to the name of a tzaddik. He took that yud because her name Sarah became, was Sarai to be, the yud was taken away and a hay was put in. So that yud was taken and put into the name Yahushua. The question is, why, what was Moshe Rabbeinu so worried about Yeshua that he was going to fall in? The Rashi says, Ko Yoshu, Yoshiacho me'atzas meraglan. Don't fall in with the, and Kolev, who didn't fall in, 
he didn't get a special bracha, but he ran to Hebron and he davened that his forefathers should daven for him that he shouldn't fall in. But Moshe Rabbeinu singled out Yehoshua, gave him the Yud, and that should be medicine, an antidote, protection, that he's not going to fall in. Why only him? He wasn't worried that the others would fall in, and they did fall in. So the answer, some of the Mephoshim say, is that Moshe Rabbeinu, felt that the ship, the other Shvatim had a schus that Yahushua did not have. That schus was going to save them. But Yahushua didn't have that schus, and he would end up falling, and so he gave him a, a separate protective shield by adding the U to his name. What was the schus that the Shivtekar had? That they, uh, Yoshua was not there by the say, by the making of the ego, of the golden calf. He was not there. He was at the bottom of the mountain. <coughs> Excuse me, waiting for Moshe Rabbeinu to <coughs> to come down. So he wasn't there when this whole thing happened. But the Sh- Shvatim, these people were all there, and they didn't participate. So they had a schus of withstanding the temptation to participate. And the Tanya and many others say that as big a nachas that HaKadosh Baruch Hu has when a Yid does a mitzvah and he does it bishlemus, he has even greater nachas HaKadosh Baruch Hu when someone is about to do an Avera and he stops from doing the Avera that he overcame his burning desire to eat the treif sandwich or to do whatever he was about to do because he had such a thirst for it. Hashem has even a bigger nachas ruach at that point than he does when a person does a mitzvah. So these shifteko were standing right there and were able to participate so, uh-uh, we're not doing, we have nothing to do with this. And that schus of holding back, for there was such a temptation, and not doing it, paved the way for a Yid Lidoros to be able to overcome the temptation and the thirst to do the wrong thing and to pull himself out from the obstacle, from the devastation that the Aveira would cause. But Yoshua didn't have the schus, Moshe Rabbeinu felt he doesn't have that schus, which teaches us that we should never let our schus go by. We were going out of a supermarket and a lady, whether she's Jewish or not Jewish, is struggling to get through the door and you run over to hold the door and she sees that a Yid, a Jew is doing this for her your Mekadashem Shemayim, and it goes a long way. And even the person right away, the Yetzirah is there, no, 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 you're busy, you're late already for the, don't take the 15 seconds. But he pushes himself and he has the 15 cents, 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 seconds, then he is able to enjoy the benefit of that Nachas Ruach that he did for our Kurdish Baruch, it will come back thousandfold for him. Now, at the end of the Sedra, when we get done talking about all the spies, the Sedra ends with the Parsha of Tzitzis. Dabiro b'nei Yisrael v'yamarta aleyem v'yasu lahem Tzitzis alkan Excuse me, then at the end of the sentence it says, V'lo sasuru acharei levavachem. Now the word sasuru is interesting because it means V'lo sasuru, you should not be led astray by your heart and by your eyes. 
And that's the beginning of our Sedra, Sasuru, via Suras Eretz Kanan, Lost Sword, to spy out. So why does our Sedra begin with that Loshan and end with that Loshan in talking about Tzitzis? Another question that is asked is that it says, which is a plural. There's a Yetzirah, there's a Yetzirah Tov. It should say, which is a single of the Yetzirah. Don't go after him. After the Yetzirah. But it refers, like it says, Eneichem. That it's two eyes and it's in the plural because rightfully so. A person's looking with the full force of his eyesight for what he wants to do, what he has, or as a protective shield. But the heart, the thing that's non-tangible, that is physical, it should only say libchem, not levavachem. But the Meforshim explain that many times the things that we do comes from the Yetzirah Tov, the good inclination. It starts off, oh, you have to go to the hospital, there's two people you know there, and you should uh, visit them and bring them something to eat. Now, it could be that you were learning and you closed the Gemara to go visit. Maybe you had no heter to do it. But in the name of doing a chesed, the Yetzirah got you. Or the people say, you know what, it's hot in here. Let's go across the street for a drink. You're not even hot. But you're ready to go along and stop whatever you're doing, learning or doing a chesed, for the sake of going with the group. So that's why it says that achrei levavachem in the plural, because sometimes it's the Yetzirah, but sometimes it's the Yetzirah that's getting you into trouble. Oh yeah, that's something I should do and I should go. The woman needs help. You don't even belong there. It's a place that <coughs> has other things there which can f- push you in to a ditch. And <coughs> it's only because the Yetzirah Tov is trying to convince you of what you should do, that it's a mitzvah. And many tzaddikim taich v'haser satan milfanenu me'acharenu. We should remove the satan from in front of us and behind us. What do you mean satan, that the Yetzirah is in front of us and behind? Because sometimes you see the Sutton, the Avera, right in front of you, and you know it's an Avera, you know it's wrong to do. But sometimes from the back behind you, where you don't even expect it, the the Yetzirah comes forcefully out and starts convincing you of how good it is to do it. You'll this, you'll that, whatever the reasoning is, but it's from left field. And... And that's our Barkasha, Bahasar Satan Milfanenu Meacharenu from before us and from behind us. So the word Sasur Velosa Suru that we should not look out for the things that are improper goes on the Libchem likewise, and that's the reason Sasuru is employed in Shema and at the beginning of our Sedra. Because what happened at the beginning of our Sedra? They went out with good intention. They thought that this is the mitzvah to do. And they became as convinced when they were already talking Rosh Hashanah about Eretz Israel. And that was the work of the Sutton to see that they fall in royally, which they did, unfortunately, and 
it cost us terribly because of it. A good Tanakh, thank you for joining us.